With the turn of each page, words spill out. Teaching, instructing, challenging. The words arrange, gather, and speak. They become etched into our reality. Faith turns into action until it becomes not only a part of our lives, but a new way to live altogether. We're happy to be in the house of God today. Remember one of my favorite verses, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Man, I'm excited. We're starting our new series in the book of James, and I think the Lord has something amazing to share with us today. So if you have your Bibles, your iPhone, your eyeballs, turn with me to the book of James chapter 1. And if you have an um, Android, the altar of the church is open. You can always come down and we'll pray for you that the Lord will forgive you of your sins and get you one of the vice that matters. Um, all right, so the book of James, chapter 1, and I'll be reading from verses 1 all the way down to verse 4. And if you are able, I'm asking that you stand for the reading of God's holy word. And here it is, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in dispersion. Greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Heavenly Father, God, please help. Amen. All right. You may have your seat today in the presence of God. Now, I don't know about you and what type of home that you were raised in, but the house where I was raised in, I had two siblings. I am the youngest one. I had two older siblings. And they always tried to trick me into doing things. So, for example, or actually they tried to trick me into telling me a lot of stories. Um, one of the best ones I can remember, my older brother tried to convince me that the Pillsbury Doughboy was actually my brother. And that if he would poke my stomach, I would make the noise, Hoo-hoo! And he would say, if I were to ever put him in the oven, I was eating my own brother. And then one day I remembered he tried to convince me that if I were to do his share of the dishes, that because he is Superman, the man of steel, that he would actually give me rides and take me flying around the neighborhood if I were to do his dishes. So like I said, I don't know what house that you were raised in, but my siblings and my older brothers always tried to convince me that they were something that chances are they weren't. And now the author of this book presents this case, and here it is. His brother is none other than Jesus. So here's the question I have for you. What would your sibling have to do to convince you that he's the Messiah? What would your brother, what would your sister, what would the person that you were raised with, what would they have to pull out of their back pocket to convince you that they're the one that you've been waiting for for thousands of years of prophecy, that you are the chosen one and you are the king of the Jews? Well, that's what we're contending here today with the author being James for this book entitled James. Now, if I can be honest, for 17 centuries, it was unanimous that James is the author of this book. But for the last two centuries, us Christians do what we do best. We get into debates and said, is it actually him? The reason why is there are three James in the Bible. There is James, the son of Zebedee. There's James, the son of Alphaeus. And then there is now this James, the son of, well, the brother of Jesus. And they said, based on the context and the language that is used, that we believe that it is James, the brother of Jesus. So we're going to go with the 17 centuries of historical data that says that this book is actually written by him. Now, here is what strikes me as odd in this book. This book tells us to do things that it sounds good. I don't know if you've ever been in church and the pastor says something and you're like, yes, that's a good word. Wait, no, it's not. What are you talking about? And that's what James encourages us to do when he goes into verse 2, where he says, count it all joy when you go through various trials and tribulation. And you want to say amen, but you're like, what? What do you mean count it all joy? And whenever someone says count it all joy, the first thing that you want to do would say, well, 
what have you been through? Because people who haven't really been through anything wants to say, hey, count it all joy. So we almost want to fact check the book of James and say, James, what have you been through to give you the authority to say, count it all joy when you go through various things? But when we look at the book of James, here's what we find. James led the church in Jerusalem, and he was the leader of it for over 20 years. And while he was the leader of it, he was the leader of the Messianic Jews, which means that they're Jews who gave their life and, and privilege over to Jesus Christ. Well, in the middle of it, they were doing so bad, right? So they were Jews. They were doing so bad that this guy by the name of Paul, maybe you heard of him, he would actually collect money from the Gentiles and say, I need this money because the Jews that are in Jerusalem are doing so bad, I need to give it to them. So this brother was having worldwide offerings being given because his church and his people were doing so bad. To make matters worse, persecution came up and these people were scattered. That's why he starts this off by saying to the 12 tribes that are in dispersion. And what he's referring to is the diaspora, a big fancy word for Jews that were living outside of Palestine, right? So what he is saying is when tribulation arose, all these people began to scatter, and they were going everywhere. And the book of James is written to tell them, don't you forget who you are when you go there. Now, the person who taught me to preach always said this, if the text is shouting, I want you to shout. If the text is quiet, I want you to be quiet. If it's somber, be somber. If it's bold, be bold. Well, today in this book of James, this brother is bold. The book of James has five chapters, 108 verses. And within that, it has 50 commands. Basically, everything that he is saying is enticing you to do something. Matter of fact, Martin Luther once said about the book of James that he wished he could light his stove with it because he hated it. He's like, there's no theology in it. You're not talking about justification by faith. But then Calvin saw it, and Calvin said, you know what? I like the book of James. You want to know why? Because Christians are living any way that they want to, and the book of James is saying this ought not to be so. So here is what the book of James is saying. I'm going to try to embody it. So if I sound bold, it's not me. If I say some things, it's not me. It's actually the scripture. So here is what the book of James is designed to say. Hey, I know that you're saved. I know that you're saved by grace through the work of Christ, and you did nothing of it on your own. However, if your works ain't lining up, it means your salvation may not be lining up. And here is what he is saying. You're not saved just to be saved. If you are saved, your salvation will show forth in your works. James literally talks about all of our cultural norms, and he smashes it under a rock. James would say, when you go somewhere, don't just treat the people nice that look like they can be a benefit to you. Treat everybody nice. James goes into talking about in his best hits of scripture verses, faith without works is, hey, you read it too. So James is saying, I don't want you to talk about it. I want you to be about it. Forget your theology. Show me your walk. Forget your talk. Walk it out. I don't care what you know. I want to care. I want to see what you do. It's not about just saying it. It's actually about just doing it. Matter of fact, I think James was the first one to coin the Nike phrase, just do it. So here we are in the book of James, and this brother just has a just do it in his heart. The Bible said that James was martyred around 62 A.D., and they said that this man was so righteous, he was so just, that he would go into the temple and pray, and he would pray so hard, they called him camel knees. And they said one day, they wanted to get rid of him, so they took him to a high place, and they threw him off of a high building, and when he fell, he hit the ground, but the ground didn't kill him. So they said, well, that's not enough. Let's throw some stones down to get him. And while he was being stoned, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Doesn't that sound like somebody else? So here we are in the book of James, and he is saying, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. And whenever he talks about meeting trials or facing trials, in the Greek, what he's really referring to, when you were surprised by the hardships of life. So he's saying, count it all joy when you were surprised when life hits you upside your head. It's bad grammar, but good gospel. So here is what he's really saying. When you go into the hospital, oh man, let's, let's rephrase back. You go home today. You decide, pastor, preach a good sermon. I want to be a better witness for God. I want to go share my neighbor the gospel. So you go over to your neighbor's house and you share them the gospel. But in the process, that neighbor gives you COVID-19. 
So now you have to go to the hospital. And while you're in the hospital, the doctor says, hey, you have cancer. And you're like, oh, my goodness. So now you're walking out the hospital with COVID and cancer. And as you're stepping out, you get a text message from your wife that says, hey, we need to talk. I've been doing some things that you probably find out about. So you're like, oh, what else could happen? And you take a step. And as you take a step, a bus comes out of nowhere and knocks you on the ground. And you're on the ground and you are bleeding. And in your last bleeding breath, James wants you to say, yes, I am happy. Count it all joy when I'm going through these things. Man, that sounds good. It sounds good until you actually start going through it. It sounds good until you actually start living it. It sounds good until you're the one getting hit by that bus. So why? And this text makes you want to ask the question, if I'm going to sacrifice my life to be a follower of Jesus, Lord, why do your people go through bad things? Why is it that we're the ones that are going through this? Wouldn't it be good enough for the unbeliever to go through it? Don't they need it more? So hopefully the pain will drive them through the cross of Christ and repent. If we're sacrificing our lives, why is it that you want us to go through hardship? And then Jesus, through the Holy Scriptures, begins to point out some things that, man, there is potential in pain. There is potential in pain. When you go through something, it squeezes you. There is this phrase that pain either busts pipes or produces diamonds. So here's the thing. Whenever you are put under pressure, what's on the inside of you comes out. And God wants to purify that. I have a friend that works for the Secret Service. I would tell you who he is, but it's a secret. And he told me the story, and I said, hey, man, um, what's the training like for the Secret Service? And he says, brother, if I told you I have to kill you, I said, well, you can keep it. And then he says, all right, I'll give you this little, little bit. So he says, they take you into places, and they put you in scenarios that are out of your comfort zone. And when they put you in these scenarios, they put pressure on you. And the reason why they start pressuring you is because they say, if something were to happen, and one day you were to actually put your life on the line, we are putting pressure on you now so that you would know how to act when it actually happens. So I said, wait, they, what kind of stuff do they do? Man, we'll, they'll exhaust you for air. They'll take you through light torture. They will take you through the brink of your life. And then they would say, let me tailor your response. And we're going to guide your response to go to a certain way because here it is. They're not trying to break you. They're trying to prepare you. The pressure is for preparation. said, my goodness. And that's what God is saying today, that I want you to count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet various trials of all kinds. When you are surprised by life, I want you to know that there is potential in the pain. And he goes on to say this, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. The Lord wants to give us a perspective on pain. He wants to give us a perspective on pain. Because if you're going through pain, your inclination is to think that God doesn't love you. If you're going through pain, your inclination is to think that you are deep in sin into something or something is wrong and you want to utilize different instruments to get out of it. But God is saying, what if there was a different perspective? There is this thing called the refiner's fire. And here is how they tested silver to make sure that silver was real. If you were to give a silversmith a big engulfing of silver, what they would do is they would melt it down to its ultimate purest form. And the way how they would do that is they would put it in a, in a receptacle and they would light the fire underneath it. And what happens when you light the fire under silver, all of the impure parts of the silver begin to rise to the top. And then he would take his trough and he would slide it over so all the impurities can go. And then he would light the fire again and more impurities would rise to the top. And then he would slide it off again. And how do you know when the silver has reached its point of being good? Well, it's reached its point of being good when the silversmith can look into it and see the reflection of himself. 
And what it's saying is God is applying pressure in your life. And God is trying to give you perspective. And God is trying to prepare you with pain so that when he looks at you, all the impurities of yourself begins to rise to the top and he squishes it off. And all of a sudden he looks at you and what he sees is not you, but he sees himself in you. Man, now I know. I know you're like, if that's what Christianity is about, don't sign me up for that. And what he does is, in verse 2, this man says, yo, man, it's not if trials come, it's when trials come. I need you to open your mind up. Matter of fact, he reminds me of somebody in Romans 12, I think his name is Paul, where Paul says, be patient and rejoice in hope and be patient in tribulation. That there is something about Christians that when we go through something, we are supposed to produce the better version of not ourselves, but God. So let me, let me get this right. So pain and problems has potential to create something good, but there is something else that happened. The other day, I told my wife something. I said, baby. Right now, I'm built for comfort. But I want to give you some muscles to hold on to. I'm not going to tell you what I told her that I was built for. So I decided, you know what, I want to go to the gym. And I want to work out. So I went to the gym and uh, your boy started flexing. Got on the bench press and started lifting. It felt easy at first. Oh, yeah. Mm, you're feeling yourself. I got this. Then all of a sudden, I got to my last few reps, and what was once easy got really hard. And here I am struggling, and I'm like, oh, this is definitely my last one, and I got it up. But I had a partner with me, and then he said something that threw me for a loop. You're rich. You got one more in you. Nah, bro, that was actually my last one. I'm done. And he's like, man, you got to feel the pump. You got to feel the burn. So he hyped me up. I was like, okay, let's do this thing. You got my back. At least I thought he did. So then I brought it down, and when I went to push up, I was like, I was waiting for the help because now I'm under pressure. And as I'm pushing up, there was no one there, and he is sitting over me like Mr. T. Come on, Rich. You got this. Come on. I'm like, man, the Lord rebuke you. I'm like, ah, and I'm squealing, and I'm squeaking, ah. And then finally, I get it up, and I'm like, ah, I get up, and I scream, and I'm like, yes, it's time to go home. So I went home, and my wife is like, oh, babe, you were working out. So she touched my arms, and she was like, ooh. I said, yeah. You see, when she started feeling on the flex, all of a sudden, the pain was worth it. But then something crazy happened. I woke up the next morning, and I was in so much pain. I could barely move. And then someone, I said, yo, how do I get rid of this pain? And they said, brother, the only way to get rid of the pain is to do what caused you the pain. I said, wait a minute, what? Are you trying to tell me I have to go back and do what I did the last time that brought me into this pain to relieve the pain? And they said, absolutely. So I went back to the gym and I put the same weight on and they said, brother, you're missing something. There's a process called progressive overload. If you lift the same weights all the time, you won't actually get stronger. So now we have to put on more weight than you did last time to stress your muscles so that you can become stronger. Is somebody getting this today? That the one thing that made you sore, the one thing that made you in pain, you have to put yourself back under that crucible, and you have to go at it again. But this time, you actually have to add more weight because the more you have, the stronger that you are going to get. And when you come out of it, what happens? You have more power. You're able to do more. You're able to go more. You're able to do more things. There is a perspective to pain, but there is actually power in your pain. As a Christian, you won't grow unless you are pushed. Consider this. What are you praying for the most right now? Your prayer life is based on what you're going through. If you don't go through anything, and I know you're holy, 
And I know you're spiritual. And I know the Lord your God is good. But if we can be honest, when things are going the greatest in our lives is when our Christian life is actually the shabbiest. If there's nothing to pray for, guess what we don't do? We don't pray. If there's nothing that is squeezing us, guess what we don't do? We don't rest in the arms of God. But the minute we start being trivialized, the minute we start facing some persecution, the minute we start going through something, what happens? We run to the foot of the cross. We run to God and say, Lord, I need your help. And God is sitting there like that train over me like Mr. T. You got one more in you. Come on, let's get through this together. And you have to dig deep and you have to push and you have to know that pain is not an indicator of God's love for you. How What, what you go through doesn't mean that God loves you less. Pain positions you to have better posture in the presence of God. There was somebody else in Scripture that went through so much pain. And man, I ignored that book for as long as I could. It was the book of Job. This brother Job, he had everything. It's one of the most perplexing books in the Bible. Job had the most beautiful wife. Job had the best kids in the world. Ever met people like that? The kids are just great. Kids never misbehave, never make a mess. Hair is always perfectly quaffed. Like, kids are just amazing. Best kids, business, super blessed. In all the land, they know that, hey, man, Job is the one that has the best cattle. Job is the one with the biggest field. Job is the one with the biggest house. Job is the one with the most beautiful wife. Job is the one with the best prayer life. Of course he's going to pray to you. Everything is going well. You don't want to mess that up. God is your sugar daddy. But then Satan came and had a conversation with God. And Satan said, I bet you, if you start to put pressure and start to crush him, he'll curse you. Because here's the truth of the matter. Of course he'll worship you when everything is going good. But the true nature of a relationship is not where you stand during moments of convenience. It's where you stand during moments of conflict. And that when things start to get bad, you know the foundation of your relationship based on how well you can weather the storm. Matter of fact, some of you have some friends that you consider to be ride or die. And the way how they get that terminology, for those who don't know, is when you are going through the storms, when everything has turned their back on you, that friend emerges and says, through thick and thin, through sickness and in health, No matter what it is, I am here with you. And they ascend into that title. And what God is saying, what side am I on? Do you just love me when things are going well, or do you still think I'm good when you're being pressed? So all of a sudden, things started happening to Job. His health started deteriorating. Are you still going to trust me, Job? All of a sudden, his kids died. My goodness, are you still going to trust me? All of a sudden, his house went away. His cattle went away. His business started to fold. His wife was so upset. His wife said, won't you just curse God and die already? All of a sudden, there is a squeezing in it. And James is reminding us, hey, keep your ethic alive. When you're going into these places, don't start acting like you forgot who God is. And here is what happened with Job. When Job went through everything, when his skin had boils on it, when his house was gone, when his kids was gone, when everything was gone, you found out what Job truly believed about God. When God begins to strip away everything in our lives, we don't find out who God is. We find out who we are. When you can't pray it away, you can't wish it away, all of a sudden you realize that the things that I was taught, that I thought I believed, that I thought I clung to, maybe, maybe I don't. So in essence, pain causes you to look internally and ask the question, do I trust God? Do I trust him? Man, one of the 
I know you're not supposed to use this word, but I'm going to use it. One of the stupidest things my parents ever told me was that this is going to hurt you far more. This is going to hurt me far more than it's going to hurt you. And I remember hearing those words. And I'm like, well, how about we switch places and see if that's true? Until I had some kids. And I was like, son, man, this is going to hurt me a lot more than it's going to hurt you. Because no good father wants to see their son go through anything. But every good father knows if you don't go through anything, you won't be able to stand for anything. That there is something that once you're under the Father's protection, that he guides you through things with him next to you to let you know you can withstand it. David knew about it. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. Your rod and your staff They comfort me. God, it doesn't look good. It's dark. I can't see where I'm going. But guess what? You are with me, and I know if anything happens to me, man, it's going to hurt you a lot more than it's going to hurt me. So I am believing in you that you are going to guide me. Let the pain do its work. Man, that's not, a, that's not something you want to shout about. That's not something you want to go preaching on the corners. But here it is. There is a There's a disfiguration of our faith happening in the media right now, happening in the society. There is a false gospel being spread that's saying that faith is an instrument to be used to wield God to do whatever you want him to do. And that is not the truth. That is not the gospel. Your faith doesn't make God do something. Your faith is a reaction to what God already did. So what God is doing is God is stirring that pot, and, man, he is doing the tootsie roll, and God is over there, like, mixing it up so things can come up out of you so that he can wash it away, but not so that you can be good, so that you can reflect him, the chief end of all men. If you have a biblical worldview, you are created to give God glory and to enjoy him forever, to be satisfied in him, to love him, to be contented by him. Our honor and our admiration is for God and it doesn't matter what he does with us as long as we are submitted in his hands that's what it means to be a believer you don't just get saved and do whatever you want man you are saved and you surrender your life to Christ James says it in verse 1 a bond servant of Jesus Christ and here is what a bond servant means it means that although I am free I bring myself back under subjection to this master, and I surrender my life to you. The Romans thought that was the silliest thing, but James took it and he rephrased it. And here is what James means by it. He says, I would rather be a servant of God and then be free in the world because there is no freedom unless you are serving God. Man, let the pain do its work. Man, let it squeeze you. Let it press you. Let it crush you because pain gives you perspective. One day you're going to look back and say, that's not as bad as I thought it was. Man, you're going to sound like Job. I knew you from others before, but after I've gone through some things, now I know you for myself. You're going to sound like some people who've been through some things. So now when you meet with someone and they're going through it and you say, hey, count it all joy. They can look at you and say, well, what have you been through? The Lord saved me from cancer. My kids were gone, but the Lord kept me through it. My job was lost, but the Lord kept me through it. I didn't get into the school I wanted, but God kept me through it. Our heroes are people who received a no and persevered and made something happen. Those are the people that we look up to, not the people where everything always goes right. But here's the crazy part. You are somebody's hero. They're looking at you to see how you persevere. And what James is telling us to do is to let it do its work so that you may be perfect, lacking nothing. Pain produces perfection. Pain produces perseverance. 
Pain produces perspective. Let the pain do its work. Man, there was somebody who ascended into the, the realm of hero in my life. Matter of fact, this brother is my own age. And here is the thing. When you see somebody go through something in a supernatural way, you know when it's happening in front of you because it's not normal. You can see how they walk through it so purposefully. This brother was my age, man. And I remember that day when he called me and said, man, Richard, my son is here. His name is Keaton Brown. Keaton called me and said, man, my son is just born. And, man, we celebrated over the phone, and I said, boy, I'm on my way. That was before COVID, right, when you could actually go visit folks. And I'm like, man, I'm on my way. And I said, guess what? I'm bringing the oil. You see, we had this joke that whenever our child would born, we'd be born, we would do the reenactment of Lion King because that's what we are. We boys and we clown like that. So I went into the hospital, and there I saw his beautiful baby boy. And, of course, I made a joke. I'm happy that the boy looks like the mom and not you. He's like, ha, 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 we all laugh. And I said, where is the child? And I walked up slowly, and I, I took the child. I pulled my oil out, put it on my thumb, and I smeared it across the child's forehead. And then in front of the nurses, I took the child, and I lift the child up. And we all sang songs. We literally did, and we all laughed. The nurses had a fit, man. We prayed over the child. We blessed the child. We spoke about how our kids would grow up together and make fun of each other the way how we do. And it was a good time. It was a moment of celebration. A couple weeks later, early in the morning, I received a phone call. When I answered the phone, I knew it was serious because I didn't hear words. I heard tears. You know what tears sound like over the phone. You can barely grab your breath. And the minute that happens, you tense up. And you say, bro, what's wrong? The next words that came out of his mouth shook me to the core. He said, Richard, my son is dead. Man, I'm coming over. I went over to be with my friend, and I consoled my friend. The very next week, I am standing there in his funeral with him and his wife burying a child that's barely a couple weeks old. And I'm standing there with him. Our college friends are there. Our, our family friends are here. And everyone is sitting around, and we're crying more than they are. And we're just, we're just literally wailing in this moment. And here is when he ascended into hero status. He stood there with his wife, and they grabbed arms. And he had, they had that look of solidarity. And they looked into the crowd, and they said, hey, I know that you're crying for me, but I want you to know this. And listen to these words. He said, you would never know that God will keep you from getting burned unless you were thrown into the fiery furnace. And then he says, you will never know that God can shut the mouths of the lion until you are thrown into the lion's den. God is I stood there and I watched him and I was so perplexed. How could God be good? How could God be good when my kid just died? And he's saying, count it all joy. That when we celebrated his life, God was good. And when we celebrated his home going, God is good. And I'm asking you in your life, is God good? Worship team, you can come up. And I'm asking you, is, is God good? And here is the thing about God and why we should rejoice in pain, because pain is an instrument in the hands of a sovereign God. Pain is something that Jesus also went through. And remember when he was crushed. Remember when he was bruised. Remember when he was beaten. Remember what he said. Lord, not my will, but let your will be done. We never want to look at pain in the positive. But if it wasn't for pain, we wouldn't be here. So I'm going to ask you to, to pray something 
That is so crazy. The Heavenly Father, I want you to use it until you choose to remove it. I'm going to ask you to press into your pain because your loving Father has you in his hand. And I want you to know that your God loves you so much that even with the pain, he has never forsaken you and he will never forsake you. But I also want you to know that the pain that you're going through is producing something so beautiful in you. And although this isn't popular, although sometimes we don't want to hear it, the pain is good news. Pain teaches us to be faithful. Pain teaches us to love. Pain teaches us to look on others with compassion because we too now have been through something. And now we can sympathize. Let the pain do its work. Let the pain do its work. Man, I wish I was preaching about how God heals right now. Yes, He heals, but He also causes you. Yes, he rescues, but he also causes you to go through the rigor. Yes, he calls, but he also causes you to get crushed. And in all through everything, book of Acts, there was an amazing phrase that kept on being said over and over again. In the book of Acts, they kept saying that the church had everything in common. That when someone would go through something, the church would rally around and everyone would be there to encourage their brother and their sister. If there was a need, the church met the need. If there was weeping, the whole community weeped. If there was laughter, the whole community laughed. It was everything happened in unison. And I believe that there's some people right now in this community, in this church, in the church right now, today, in this room, that you are being pressured by your tribulation. But that pressure is producing perseverance. That pressure is producing perfection. That pressure is producing power. And I want you to know that you are not in it by yourself, that we have everything in common. And today I want to pray with you. And normally when I pray, I pray things like, Lord, take this away. Lord, I know you're able to heal. But today, I'm praying what the book of James said, that count it all joy when we go through these things, knowing that, knowing that these afflictions are producing something beautiful inside of us. So today I'm going to pray, Lord, won't you use it until you decide to remove it? And here is what I'm asking you to do. I am asking you to lean into that fiery fire. Lean into that lion's den. Lean into that fire that refines that silver. Lean into that weight that makes you stronger. Lean in because God will never let you break. He has you and he will produce something powerful in you. It's not popular, but it's true. So if that's you, on the count of three, I'm going to ask that you stand and we're going to pray together. We're going to sing. We're going to celebrate. If that's you on a count of three, if you're going through something and you're like, man, I am pressed down but not crushed. And you say, man, I just want my community to stand and pray with me. On a count of three, I want you to stand and keep standing. One, two, three. If that's you, stand to your feet right now. I see you standing all over the room. In the name of Jesus, man, we are going to pray. And as you stand, I felt the Lord impress something on my heart. And I said this in the sermon, but I want to say it again. Pain does not mean that I don't love you. Pain doesn't mean that I've deserted you. I have a plan for you. Father God, we come to you. And by worldly standards, Lord, we sound like we are mad. Because who wants to serve a God who sometimes would say, crush them so I can create something beautiful in them. Who wants to create a God? Who wants to serve a God that 
allows them to go through things so beautiful things can be awakened inside of them. But Lord, here is what we know, that you love us, and we know that you love us because you were crushed for us. You went through pain for us. And you said, man, what I went through, that's what you're going to go through. So God, what we are asking for is, I want you to use the pain until you decide to remove the pain. Whatever it is, if it's our kids, God, use it. You love them more than we do. If it's our health, Lord, use it. You have it in your hand. You're able to do all things. God, whatever it is that you are using, use it until you decide to remove it. We lean into you. We are saying, God, please help. We can't do it on our own, but by your grace, but by your power, we can stand in the fire and not be burnt. We can go into the lion's den and not be devoured because your hand is mighty. Your love is graceful. You are everlasting, God. Please help. And we promise to give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, let's sing this song together.
Take up the ground of all my tradition. Break down the walls of all my religion. Your way is better. Your way is better. So shake up the ground of all my tradition. Break down the walls of all my religion. Your way is better. singing that song, um, I remember that I opened up with a story about my big brother. When I was there, the Lord reminded me of another story. If you ever get to meet him, he's a pretty cool guy. Um, he's a little bit bigger than me, he's a little bit stronger, or whatever. Whatever. And I remember growing up, he always used to beat me up. Like, it was like a real big One day I was like, yo, why do you always beat me up? He said something to me that always stuck with me. He says, my job as your big brother is to beat you up so that no one out there can. That if you can take what I'm giving you, and you go out there to somebody who looks like you that's your size, there's nothing that they can do to you to shake you. But I'm first giving you my beat so you can get the strength. So he was punishing me to prepare me. And at the time, I looked at him like, you are insane. That makes no sense. But little did I know it actually did. And what he took me through when no one was looking prepared me for when I went to school and someone said something and someone did something. If I could stand up to my brother, I could stand up. God is saying, man, I'm preparing some of you and doing some things in you in private so that when you go public, man, you won't be shaken. We can't afford any more Christians that get shaken. And God is saying, I am building some deep roots in you so that when the time comes, I have prepared you. And it won't always be bad. Because sometimes the good things shake you just as bad as, just as much as the bad. That whether when blessings come or when hardship comes, you are rooted in me. And I thank God for a church. I thank God that I get to pastor a church that says whether good or bad, my resolve is God. Can we celebrate that today? Well... There's some folks that I want to celebrate in the room. Um, you can actually have your seat for this portion. There's some transitions that are happening at the chapel. And I want you to know that I believe the chapel produces the best people on earth, okay? And um, there are two individuals that some great things are happening for, and we want to celebrate them today. Matter of fact, that's Cindy and Paul. And if you can come up, there's some things that uh, we want to talk about. So here it is. So Cindy has what I call good problems, right? Um, Cindy came to me and said, hey, pastor, I just got promoted on both my jobs. And I said, man, I hope that tribulation produces something good in your life, right? It's so sad that you're getting more money. Um, and she says, man, I'm actually living in my passion now. And Cindy gets to have the influence that people dream of but never really get to walk a 
walk in sometimes. Cindy gets the opportunity to influence influencers. And she gets to disciple them and lead them closer to Christ on a scale that is ridiculous. So the Lord has really just opened up his floodgates of blessing for her. So Cindy came to me, and Cindy served as our life groups coordinator. And she says, Pastor, man, I love you, but, man, would you allow me to be released from this position so I can do what I believe I'm really called in? And I looked at her and said, how dare you ask me that? No. Um, but I believe that God is blessing Cindy, and he has given her the influence that he needs to lead leaders to become deeper walkers and fellowshipers of Jesus Christ. And we want to celebrate Cindy for the things that she's done. Now, I want to make this clear. She is not leaving. Okay, um, I would lasso Cindy and tie her around me because if you've ever worked with her, this woman gets it done. Okay, so she's not leaving. Our relationship just looks different. So church, we just want to celebrate Cindy for everything that she's done for us and say, Cindy, thank you. We love you. And you are amazing. The next celebration we're doing is for the brother named Paul. Then he sings so beautiful today. And... Paul has been a staple at this church from the minute that he came here. Man, Paul is a guy who stays, comes earlier than everyone else and stays later than everyone else. He's the one that if you need someone to count on, man, it, it's Paul. That's the guy that you call. And we had a need that arose here with Cindy transitioning out. We had a need, and I was like, hey, Paul, guess what? I believe that this church is going to influence this neighborhood to a degree that we have yet to be seen. And I believe that, man, our doors are going to be packed with people that are going to come in this church because God is going to wreck their life and they're going to need to be shepherded and they're going to need to be cared for. But we don't have a care department to nurture them and guide them when they're in the most vulnerable position. And I said, man, I believe that you are the man for this job. You have the heart for it and you have the ability for it. So Paul says, you know what? I believe that's God and I want to step into it. So Paul is going to be transitioning from our worship leader to our care director and coordinator. And he is the one that's going to make sure that we get the love of God into these people when they come in this church and when they need God to stand when they're most vulnerable. So Paul, you have been a pillar and you have established a worship team from absolutely nothing. And we want to let you know that we thank you for your perseverance. We thank you. And he's not leaving. He's just working in a different role in the church. And we just want to celebrate you and say thank you. And I look forward to building God's kingdom with you. Man, with that, can we stand? I'm going to say a prayer of dismissal. And you will be released to go and take me out to lunch. I y'all thought that was funny. Um. But let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your love. And we just thank you that you are God. And you are always good, despite what we're going through. Lord, as we leave this place, but never from your presence, I pray that you give us traveling mercies. Allow us to love you more. Allow us to fall deeply in love with you and see sides of you that we have never seen. I pray for the children, the chapel kids, Lord. Um, as we're opening up October 4th and we need servant leaders, Lord, I pray that you would impress it on the hearts of the people here to serve in the ministry to children, Lord. And God, even in this prayer, I'm going to make this announcement that after this service, that right afterwards, um, man, in the upper room, God, there is going to be a meeting for people to meet to talk about serving the kids. And I pray that today you would put it on the hearts of your people to walk right down the hall and say, yes, sign me up because we want our children to learn more about God. And Lord, I pray that according to the book of Daniel, that our kids will be found 10 times wiser than anyone who opposes the gospel that is within them, that they will be the head and not the tail, the influencers and not the influencees, that they would stand on the rock of Christ and that they would influence their culture to say, God is good. Now unto the king who is eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. To him be the glory, the honor, the dominion and power. And the people of God that love him say amen.